Okay, so get ready to dive into a real head scratcher today um, mm -hmm. because you sent us down a rabbit hole with these YouTube videos about Shakespeare. Yeah, it's a popular one. Really? That's for sure. The idea that someone else entirely might be behind those famous plays and sonnets. Exactly. It's like yeah. literary espionage trying to uncover a secret author hidden in plain sight. Well. Yeah. And this theory you've been digging into, yeah. it centers around a pretty fascinating figure, Christopher Marlowe. Right. Marlowe Shakespeare's contemporary. Right. Already a celebrated playwright in Elizabethan England. Known for works like Dr. Faustus. Of course, yeah. But what makes him even more intriguing is his sudden and mysterious death in 1593. And that's where things get really interesting, right? Exactly. Because the theory suggests Marla didn't die, right. but instead went into hiding and continued to write under different names, right. including potentially William Shakespeare. Exactly. It's a bold claim, and to understand it, we need to look at the historical context. Mm -hmm. The Elizabethan era was a time of great political and religious upheaval. Right. Um, expressing certain views, especially those deemed heretical or treasonous, could land you in serious trouble. So you're saying that someone like Marlowe, a known playwright already pushing boundaries with works like Dr. Faustus, might have reason to fear for his safety. Precisely. And that fear, yeah. according to this theory, led him to stage his own death and disappear from public life. Wow. The videos you sent point to the circumstances of Marlowe's death, which are shrouded in mystery, as potential evidence for this. So walk us through that. Okay. What do we actually know about how Marlowe died? Well, the official record states that he died in a tavern brawl, but the details are murky. Murky? How so? There were conflicting accounts from witnesses, rumors of espionage, and even whispers that Marlowe had been involved in forbidden religious practices. It sounds less like a bar fight and more like the plot of one of his plays. It does, doesn't it? And that's what makes this theory so tantalizing. Yeah. Those unanswered questions surrounding Marlowe's death leave room for speculation, for imagining alternative versions of history. And that's where Michael Drayton enters the picture, right? Exactly. The video suggests that he wasn't just another playwright of the time, well, but potentially one of Marlowe's assumed identities. Exactly. And one of the key pieces of evidence the videos present is the sudden surge in Drayton's literary output after Marlowe's supposed demise. Oh. It's as if someone needed a new outlet for their creativity. Right. It's like a game of yeah. literary musical chairs. Right. One playwright disappears, and suddenly another one steps in producing work at an astonishing rate. And not just any work. Right. The videos draw a parallel between Marlowe's play Edward II and a poem that Drayton published just a year after Marlowe's supposed death called Piers Gaveston. Okay, so remind us who Piers Gaveston was and why this connection is significant. So Piers Gaveston was the close confidant and, some historians argue, lover of King Edward II. Right. Marlowe's play explores their relationship and the political turmoil it caused in a way that was quite scandalous for the time. So by writing about Gaveston so soon after Marlowe's death, Drayton could be seen as picking up the mantle, so to speak. That's one way to interpret it. Yeah. The videos argue that this choice of subject matter wasn't a coincidence, but a deliberate echo of Marlowe's own preoccupations. It's like sending a coded message through their work, hinting at a shared identity or connection. Right. And the videos don't just stop there, do they? They go even deeper, analyzing specific lines and themes in Drayton's poems, looking for hidden clues. Exactly. They point to works like Drayton's sonnet sequence, mm -hmm. Idea of the Shepherd's Garland, published in 1593, the same year Marlowe supposedly died, which includes a dedication to Roland Sacrifice. Roland, which right. sounds a lot like Marlowe if you say it a certain way. Exactly. And Sacrifice, which could be interpreted as giving up his identity to continue writing. It's like, an, it's like a literary puzzle with these potential clues scattered throughout. Exactly, and like any good puzzle. Yeah. It's all about finding the connections, the hidden patterns that might reveal a larger picture. So we've got this possible faked death this sudden surge in Drayton's writing, and these intriguing parallels between their works. Right. But the videos don't stop there, do they? They bring in even more characters from Elizabethan literary circles, right. suggesting this wasn't just a solo act, but a whole conspiracy of silence around Marlowe's survival. Right. The videos introduce us to Francis Mares. Okay. A clergyman and writer who, in 1598, published a book called Pilatus Tamia. Okay. Now, this book is essentially a survey of English literature, okay. praising various poets and playwrights. Sounds innocent enough. 
Right. How does this tie into the whole Marlowe is Shakespeare theory? Well, this is where it gets interesting. Okay. Maras praises Drayton extensively. Okay. Even goes so far as to mention some of Drayton's future works. What? Works that at the time of Maras' writing hadn't even been published yet. Wait, so he's predicting Drayton's future output. That's either incredible foresight or right. something else is going on. Right. Yeah. It's as if Mares is privy to some inside information right. suggesting a connection between him and Drayton that goes beyond the typical critic-subject relationship. And then there's the way Mares talks about Shakespeare. Right. It's almost evasively. Right. He lists a bunch of Shakespeare's plays, but in this oddly vague way. Right. Almost like he's hesitant to say too much. Exactly. And this, according to the videos, is yet another clue. Okay. They argue that Mares's strange wording, his almost cryptic references to Shakespeare, yeah. are deliberate attempts to obscure the truth about Shakespeare's identity. So it's like a big literary game of whispers with everyone hinting at the truth, but no one daring to say it out loud. Yeah, like, this is getting good. Who else gets pulled into this web of intrigue? Well, the videos point to a number of other figures in the Elizabethan literary scene, mm -hmm. suggesting a sort of unspoken understanding or at least a shared secret about Marlowe's continued existence. Right. For example, they bring up Robert Armin. Robert Armin. Yeah, he right. was an actor and playwright who actually worked with Shakespeare's company. Right. Exactly. Okay. And he was known for his satirical wit. Okay. The videos analyze some of his work. Okay. Suggesting that certain characters and situations might be veiled references to Marlowe and this clandestine group of writers who knew the truth about his supposed demise. So even the comedies of the time might hold clues to this larger mystery. It's a fascinating idea, isn't it? It is, yeah. And the videos go on to explore other potential players in this supposed conspiracy. Okay. Like Henry Chettle, a publisher and playwright. Did he write something called England's Morning Garment after Queen Elizabeth died? That's the one. Okay. It was a kind of elegy mourning the Queen's passing and calling out various poets for not writing proper tributes. Okay, a bit morbid, but where does the conspiracy angle come in? Well, in the book, Chettle uses pseudonyms for all the poets he mentions. Okay. And get this, Shakespeare is referred to as mellifluous. Mellifluous. The exact same word Francis Mayers used to describe Shakespeare in Palatistamia. Interesting. So it could be a coincidence or it could be another intentional breadcrumb linking these writers and their knowledge of this Shakespeare secret. Right. What about Drayton? Does Chettle mention him too? He does. Ugh. And he calls him Colleton. Now, why mm. is that significant? Yeah. Well, because Colleton happens to be the name of a village very near Drayton's birthplace. Okay, that seems a little too on the nose to be a mere coincidence. It's but, like they're speaking in code, leaving clues for anyone who knows where to look. Precisely. Yeah. And the videos argue that these clues, taken together, point to a deliberate attempt to create a smokescreen around the real author of Shakespeare's works. So it's not just about hidden identities, but about protecting a legacy, maybe even revising history itself. Exactly. And this is where the videos start to delve into some really intriguing questions about authorship and authenticity. Okay. They ask, what does it mean for a work of art to be original? Right. And who gets to decide who the real author is? Those are big questions. But it seems like the deeper we dive into this theory, the more those questions become unavoidable. Right. And speaking of unavoidable. Right. We have to talk about Shakespeare's will. Right. Isn't that one of the strongest pieces of evidence that the man from Stratford was, in fact, the author of those famous plays? It is, and it isn't. Oh. The will exists, of course. Right. And it does link a William Shakespeare to Stratford upon Avon. Right. But the videos raise some interesting points about the handwriting in the will. Okay, like what? I'm no handwriting expert, yeah. but how can that be contested? Well, back in the 20th century, a handwriting expert named Charles Hamilton analyzed the will. Okay and found some striking similarities between it and the handwriting in a play called Sir Thomas More. And why is that significant? I'm drawing a blank on that one. Sir Thomas More is a play that was, at one point, attributed to Shakespeare. Okay. There is some debate about whether he wrote the whole thing, but many scholars agree that at least one scene in the play bears the mark of his hand. So the theory is that if the handwriting in the will matches the handwriting in Sir Thomas More, right. and Shakespeare was involved in writing that play, right. it could suggest that he was also the author of the works attributed to Shakespeare. Exactly. But here's where it gets really interesting. Okay. The scene in Sir Thomas More 
that's most likely Shakespeare's so was probably written around 1593. Okay. The same year Marlowe supposedly died and Drayton's career took off. So the timeline lines up with this theory of Marlowe assuming a new identity and continuing to write. Right. Like a literary game of Clue, yeah. trying to figure out who was writing where and when. Precisely. Yeah. And the videos present even more circumstantial evidence, Not like a diary entry from John Ward, who became the vicar of Stratford-upon-Avon in 1662. Stratford-upon-Avon, Shakespeare's hometown. What does this diary entry say? Well, in this yeah. entry, yeah. Ward recounts a story he heard about a merry meeting between Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, okay. and, you guessed it, Michael Drayton. What? Shortly before Shakespeare's death. Wow. And the entry even claims that Shakespeare died of a fever he caught during this supposed hangout session. Interesting. But also a bit convenient for this theory, don't you think? Placing Drayton and Shakespeare together right before Shakespeare's death? Right. It's important to note that we're relying on a secondhand account here. Right. On local gossip that may or may not be reliable. Right. But it's a tantalizing detail nonetheless. It is. And it raises more questions than it answers. Right. Like, what was Drayton doing in Stratford in the first place? Right. As far as we know, he had no real connection to the town. Right. And if this meeting did happen, why isn't there more documentation of it elsewhere? Good questions. These right. are the kinds of mysteries that fuel these alternative histories. Right. And the videos suggest that these unanswered questions, right. these loose threads in the official narrative, right. point to a deliberate cover-up. So we've got this mysterious meeting in Stratford, a will with questionable handwriting, and a whole lot of whispers and coincidences. Right. But what about Drayton himself? Where does his story end? Well, that's another curious detail. Okay. Drayton died in London in 1631. Okay. And is believed to be buried in Westminster Abbey in Poet's Corner, no less. Oh, wow. There's even a monument to him there. Sounds like a pretty respectable end for a respected poet. Right. So what's the mystery? The mystery is that there's no official burial record for him. What? Despite his prominence as a poet during his lifetime. Right. There's no documentation that he's actually buried beneath that grand monument. Okay, now that is strange. Yeah. Almost like he disappeared all over again. It is strange. So we've got Marlowe potentially faking his death, Drayton's sudden rise to fame, these odd literary connections, a shady will, a secret meeting, and now a missing body. Right. This is like something out of a spy novel. It's certainly a captivating narrative. It is. But before we get too carried away, we have to ask, Yeah. what was Drayton's reputation like during his lifetime. Right. Was he really considered a literary giant on par with Shakespeare? Right. Because well, if he was, it makes you wonder why he's been largely forgotten by history while Shakespeare's fame only grows. It's a good point. Yeah. It's one thing to suggest that Marlowe might have written in under a different name. Right. But it's another thing entirely to say that this other name, right. this Michael Drayton, was equally as talented, right. equally as influential. Right. So tell us, what kind of acclaim did Drayton receive while he was alive? So we've heard what the theory suggests about Michael Drayton and his possible connection to this whole Shakespeare authorship question. Right. But we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the other side of the coin. Exactly. What do traditional Shakespeare scholars say about this theory that Marlowe might be the true author? Well, they generally approach it with a healthy dose of skepticism. Which is understandable. I mean, we're talking about a theory that challenges centuries of accepted scholarship. Exactly. Traditional Shakespeare scholars point to a wealth of evidence that supports the traditional view that William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, right, a actor and businessman, right, was indeed the author of the plays and poems attributed to him. So what kind of evidence are we talking about? What supports the case for Shakespeare of Stratford? Well, for one, they point to the historical record. Yeah. Shakespeare was a known entity in the London theater scene. Right. His name appears in contemporary accounts, play quartos, and even legal documents related to his acting company. So there's a paper trail that connects Shakespeare to the world of theater. Exactly. And this trail, while not always complete, is substantial enough for traditional scholars to argue that it would be highly unlikely for someone else to have been writing under Shakespeare's name without anyone noticing. But couldn't that be explained away by this theory of a conspiracy? Right. Of a group of people deliberately working to protect Marlowe's secret. That's the crux of the debate, isn't it? Right. Traditional scholars acknowledge that there are gaps in the historical record. Right. But they argue that these gaps are not evidence 
in and of themselves. Right. Right. Absence of evidence, as they say, is not evidence of absence. Okay, I see their point. Right. But what about the argument that Shakespeare, right. with his relatively humble background and lack of formal education, yeah. simply wouldn't have had the knowledge or experience to write such sophisticated plays? That's a common critique. Yeah. And one that the videos you sent lean on heavily. Right. But traditional scholars point out that while Shakespeare may not have attended university, he was likely well-read and would have been exposed to a wide range of ideas through his work in the theater. Okay. Remember, this was a time when the theater was a central part of public life, a place where people from all walks of life came together to be entertained and informed. So the theater itself was a kind of education. Yes. A melting pot of ideas and experiences. Precisely. Right. And don't forget that Shakespeare was writing for a diverse audience, yep. not just the educated elite. Right. His plays are full of humor, wordplay, and relatable characters that would have resonated with people from all walks of life. That makes sense. Yeah. But still, there's that lack of personal writings from Shakespeare. Right. No letters, diaries, journals. Right. Nothing that gives us a glimpse into his inner life or creative process. Right. Doesn't that seem strange for someone who was supposedly such a prolific writer? It's true that we don't have a lot of personal writings from Shakespeare, which is a source of frustration for scholars and fans alike. Yeah. But traditionalists argue that this lack of personal writings doesn't necessarily mean he didn't write the plays. Okay. After all, very few personal documents from this period have survived. Right, right. What we do have are the plays themselves. Right. And they're full of insights into human nature, love, loss, ambition, jealousy, right. all the timeless themes that continue to resonate with us centuries later. So they're saying that the plays are the biography, in a way. Exactly. And they point to the consistency of style, right. the recurring themes, right. the sheer brilliance of the language as evidence that a single extraordinary mind was behind it all. It's a compelling argument, for sure. Yeah. And I have to say, after diving deep into the Marlowe theory, it's both exhilarating and a bit comforting to revisit the traditional perspective. It's like exploring a familiar room with fresh eyes, isn't it? <laughs> Even if we ultimately come to the same conclusion, the journey itself can deepen our understanding and appreciation. So where do we land on this debate? Oh. Did Marlowe fake his death and become Shakespeare? Or is William Shakespeare of Stratford the true author of those iconic plays? As with so many mysteries of history, there's no easy answer, no definitive proof. Right. The beauty of this debate is that it forces us to confront the limits of our knowledge and the ambiguities inherent in historical interpretation. It's like we're piecing together a puzzle with some of the pieces missing. Yeah. We can fill in the gaps with speculation, with imagination, yeah. but we may never know for sure what the complete picture looks like. And maybe that's okay. Right. Maybe the real value in exploring these alternative theories lies not in finding definitive answers, but in asking better questions and challenging our assumptions. Right. And in marveling at the enduring power of these works, regardless of who actually wrote them. It's a reminder that history is not just a collection of facts, but an ongoing conversation. Exactly. A process of discovery and rediscovery. And sometimes the most compelling stories are those that leave us with more questions than answers. Well said. And who knows, maybe one day some new piece of evidence will come to light, shedding new light on this centuries-old debate. Until then, the mystery continues. It certainly does. Yeah. So, to our listeners out there, we leave you with this final thought. Okay. The next time you pick up a book or watch a play, take a moment to consider the person or people behind the words. Yeah. Who were they? What were their lives like? Yeah. And what secrets might they be hiding within the pages? Right. What a question. What a question to ponder. 